Hey everybody, the July 2021 Roundup is brought to you by Fun Again Games. And July was a very big month for Rotto Runs Through because I launched a new show, which is something I very rarely do. I tend to stay in my lane and just run through games for the most part. But last week, on Wednesday, we put up the first episode of a brand new show, The R&R Show. And R&R stands for Rotto and Ruel Gaviola, who's a friend of mine. I've known him for over a year now, ever since he first got online and started doing his own live YouTube streaming uh, channel. Or actually, he started out on Facebook, then was on YouTube for a little bit, and then ultimately ended up on Twitch, where you can find him and his wife, Michelle, all the time, constantly playing games, demonstrating games, and Ruel is just the nicest person you are ever going to meet. We did a couple of top 10 collaborations last year. We did a Kickstarter special, and I mean, I just enjoyed talking to him so much about games on camera, but just about life off camera, and I wanted more of that in my life. And um, you may recall last year, I was doing a show for quite a while, for many, many months, called Corner to Corner with Tom Vassell, where it was just every week we would talk about various and sundry game topics, take questions and answers and all that. And ever since that went offline, because it was just getting tougher and tougher for um, Tom and I to to mesh our schedules. We're both very busy. It was tough to make it continue to work. And uh, so we happily parted ways. The C to C show was, um, you know, uh, put out to pasture. And ever since then, people were saying, we want more, we want more. That's where the R&R show comes in because the intent is every week for the two of us to get together for about an hour and just talk games. Talk about future games, present games, past games, take questions from the audience. Uh, We'll bring back the audience suggested top five lists, although I think they might be top threes now. Um, And we have uh, ideas for a whole bunch of segments. Um, Making Ruel rank his game library. Um, Some this or that type stuff. All kinds of really cool things every week. We should be giving you new, interesting game-related content, and I can guarantee you, he and I will be having a great time doing it. We really enjoy each other's company, and uh, I I think we vibe really well. I've got kind of a manic energy. He's much more chill and laid back, and, you know, just silky smooth, and uh, I mean, actually, obviously, the first episode's been up. Uh, It's got a bunch of comments. I think my favorite one was somebody said, it's so wholesome. There's just two friends, talking about board games for an hour and being very positive and upbeat. And that's what we want this show to be. Whether we're talking about games or um, giving away games, for example. And that's something um, that I wanted to point out. Folks, for the first episode, we are giving away this is still in shrink copy of Fort, which is an excellent um, card tableau building game all about recapturing those uh, uh, childhood summer days of building forts in your backyards and playing with all the neighborhood kids. You can watch my run through to find out more about it. It's an excellent card game, and we are giving one copy away to one lucky winner. And all you got to do to enter, well, not surprisingly, is go watch the show. Um, If you watch the show in the first 10 minutes, it will be explained what you have to do. Basically, you have to send an email to an email address with a secret word that was mentioned at one point in the episode. So if you would like Fort, and if you don't have it, you should. It's an excellent game. Um, Really wonderful stuff there. Very, very clever design. Um, This could be coming your way free of charge anywhere in the world. Just go check out the first episode of the R&R Show. You can hit that I in the top right corner of the screen. There's a link for it, or there's a link for it down in the show notes. And hopefully, you will find yourself enjoying it as much as Ruel enjoy putting it on. And we'll be here every Wednesday, 12 noon PST, um, for the foreseeable future, just talking about our deep, deep love of games. And I hope you can join us and tell us about your love of games too. Okay. That was the big news. But you know what? That's talking about the future. Let's talk about the past. Let's um, count down all the games we played over the last four weeks, because that's what this roundup is. Uh, We'll start with our least favorite, end with our most favorite. Uh, uh, New game of the month, uh, promised every month. And uh, before we start with all the games that my wife Jen and I played, and it was a very interesting, oddball month, actually. I'll talk about that when we get to us. First, we got to start out with Shay, my number one contributor, who I believe played four games of his own, and he's going to walk us through them countdown style, least favorite to most favorite, starting now. Okay, Shay, take it away. Hey folks, so I played four games this month, and while I am going to rank them, because you know that's what we're here to do, I do want to say up front that I loved 
all four of these games. So even though one of them is going to be on the bottom of the list, I would gladly play all of them again. Uh, they were a ton of fun, and I really uh, enjoyed them. So uh, I'm going to start with my number four, Lands of Galzir. Now this was a paid preview, um, and uh, this is a storytelling adventure game, very much in the vein of uh, Tales of Arabian Nights, but it is uh, a much gentler theme. It's got you know uh, anthropomorphic animals in uh, you know your sort of fantasy world. You are going to be wandering around uh, the different cities and towns and just sort of encountering the world. But unlike uh, the Tales of Arabian Nights, I think this game has a lot more focus and it is a lot more streamlined. You have certain quests that you go on and these quests will un uh, unfold into uh, a, a series of, you know, it's a series of quests that connect to make a narrative and that really helps you to get involved in the game. I really felt connected to the characters that I played and the stories that they told. Um, I also felt that this game was very accessible. Uh, you know, there was so much going on that uh, it I think that anyone can really enjoy. You know, there are a lot of games that try to do storytelling games and try to make them dark or like really gritty. No, this is a much more pleasant experience than that. I, like I said in the, in the final thoughts, I was absolutely charmed by this game. Um, I will say though that it is pretty mechanics light, which is why it's on the bottom of the list. Um, now, like with Tales of Arabian Nights, which is similar, the mechanics are not the point of the game. You're tell you're playing this game to tell a story with your friends. And what I like most about Lands of Galzir is that the story doesn't end at the end of the game. Instead, you are going to, uh, once the game is over, you pack up your character, all their items, any quests that they haven't finished, and you're going to pack it away because you will continue them on the next game you play. It's not exactly a legacy game, but it does have these ongoing elements. So I really enjoyed that about it. Uh, so that was my number four, Lands of Galzir. Uh, now, number three was Assassin's Creed uh, Brotherhood of Venice. And this I really, really dug. Now, I don't have a ton of time for long campaign games, which is one, part of the reason why this is uh, at number three instead of any higher. But for a campaign game, I think this is excellent. Now, it is not just a great game on its own, which it is, but it's also a great adaptation of a video game series. Um, Assassin's Creed is a stealth assassination game, and that's what you've got here. A lot of campaign games in this style are about brawling. You're going to face up against a bunch of enemies or some really big ones, and you have to defeat them in combat. And while you do do that in Assassin's Creed, the primary focus is on stealth. You are trying to avoid danger as long as you can, and you're only really fighting when you have to. Uh, that, I think, really helps tie you into the setting, and I think that is a kind of a fresh take on this kind of game. Now... The slight problem I had with it is just that it's so big uh, and it's so there's so many minis in it that it is a very expensive game and it's a very big box, which you know for hobbyist board gamers might not be an issue, but because this is based on a video game and because it's so accessible and it's such a good game, I think that it could otherwise be really appealing to get video gamers into the hobby. And so I wish that there was a budget option. If there was, this would be this would definitely be higher on the list uh, as it is right now. It is still a very good game. It's just a little expensive, which is why uh, it's down at number three. Uh, now, number two is another paid preview, and it's one that I've already previewed on the channel before. That is ISS Vanguard. And the reason I am uh, looking at it again was because there were a lot of changes from the original prototype to uh, now, and they wanted to you know, update people on what has been going on. And I can tell you, all of those updates are for the better. This game, which I already loved, is even better. It is a fantastic fantastic game. Again, it is a campaign game. It takes up a lot of my time, but I played every mission in the prototype that I got. I didn't have to. Uh, once I was done, uh, and once I filmed the run-through, I could have packed it up, sent it to the next reviewer, but I didn't. I made sure to get in even more gameplays to finish the, what little story I had because I enjoy it so much. I am so hooked on this story of it's a little bit in the future, and we are exploring the galaxy because we've discovered this mystery encoded into our DNA, and uh, we need to solve this mystery to, to figure out, you know, what is the secret of our existence? Like, why are we here, and why are all of these clues uh, bound together by this strange alien signal? 
It is a fascinating story, and the gameplay is also a ton of fun. There's two halves of it. There's the planetary exploration, which you're you're going to different planets. You're bringing uh, different members of the different crew sections, like security or science or uh, recon or engineering. Um, each section has multiple different crew members that you can take on a mission. Um, you bring equipment with you, but you also have certain skills, and those skills are going to help you with various encounters on the map. It's a lot of dice chucking, but you do have a fair amount of control over your probabilities, at least. Uh, but on top of that, you have, or uh, aside from it, you have the other half of the game, which is the ship phase. And this has you managing the different sections of your ship and deciding where you're going to go, what you're going to allocate your uh, what you're going to allocate your resources on, and uh, you know how you are going to interact with the rest of the story. I like the the um, I like the planetary phase a lot. I love the ship phase in this game. I really like management games uh, in you know video game terms. I, I like Civilization a lot, things like that. So something that really gets lets you get into the nitty gritty of this. Um, I, I really responded to, so I absolutely love that side of it. Um, but it was not my number one game. Uh, even though I absolutely love ISS Vanguard, my number one game uh, was Watergate. And this is a game that I had the good fortune to play alongside Ruel Gaviola, who is not just a friend of mine, not just a friend of the show, is now a contributor of uh, to the Rado channel. And in case Richard hasn't said anything about it yet, I want to uh, at least throw my uh, foot in and to say that the r and &R show with Richard and Well is a ton of fun. I got to catch the first episode and I really enjoyed it. They're talking games, they're uh, answering questions, they're doing giveaways. It's a ton of fun. I really recommend it. And I got to sit down with Ruel and play a game with him. Okay. I did not expect Shay to actually do a call out for that. I did not ask, but thank you very much, Shay. Again, we had a great time. The R&R &R show, links for it down in the show notes. Win your copy of Fort, but let's get back to Shay. I'm glad he enjoyed it too. All righty. Which I absolutely love doing. Uh, and we played Watergate. Now this is a game that both of us have played before and absolutely love. We, I mean, like we said in the run through uh, or in the final thoughts, I think it's just kind of a perfect game. It's a two player strategy game where one player is Nixon and the other player are the press trying to uncover all of the secrets that uh, Nixon is trying to keep buried. Um, it involves uh, connecting evidence between informants uh, or hiding evidence and uh, securing uh, the informant's silence, depending on who you're playing. But the main part of the game is this tug of war. Uh, there's uh, a number of things that each player is trying to control, either the initiative, uh, which helps you, you know, go first and do more actions each round. Uh, you're trying to get momentum, which for Nixon is how they win the game. They, you know, they ride out the storm and finish their term. Um, but for the press, it gives you extra powers if you can get enough momentum. Uh, and then there's bits of evidence, which Nixon knows what they are, but the, the press, they are the ones who really need it so that they can connect this big honeycomb web of, uh, of evidence and informants. It's, it's a very tight game mechanically. Uh, there's no wasted space. Uh, and it's just, it's so tense. When you're playing it, every, every moment, every move has you tense because you have to you have to give up certain things to gain ground in other areas. And uh, like I said in the run through, I have never won this game and I keep wanting to come back to it. And that's how I know that I love a game because I, even though I've never won it, I've never had the satisfaction. I thought I was going to against Ruel. I was so close, but he snatched it away from me. No, but I still want to keep coming back and, and play uh, more Watergate. Uh, like we said in the final thoughts, it reminded us uh, a little bit um, of Twilight Struggle, but a very pared down, very tight version of it uh, that kind of just focuses on the best parts of it. The card play in particular is what uh, really reminded us of it, but it's even if you haven't played that, or even if you played that and wasn't really your bag, I definitely think you should check out Watergate. It is a ton of fun. It's a great two-player strategy game, and it's quick. It's not like, it's not easy. It's not, uh, I mean, it, it's the rules are not particularly complicated, but there's definitely strategy. You absolutely have to strategize in this game, but even with the depth uh, of it, 
it's over in like 30 minutes. It's a nice, really quick game uh, that really leaves you satisfied in the end. So my number one, Watergate. And that was all of the games that I played this month. Uh, so I will pass it back to you, uh, Richard. But everyone else, thank you for watching my little bit of this. And uh, I will see you folks next time. Bye. Yeah, I got to say, uh, his run-through, or his and Ruel's run-through for Watergate was nail-biting right up to the end. And I'm, I'm kind of bummed he just spoiled the ending, but I think it would still be very, very enjoyable to show off why this game is so hugely popular and well-loved. So I was really happy to see that. But, okay, we're done with Shay's stuff. Now we're going to move on to the games Jen and I played. And this was kind of a weird month because we played a bunch of games at a friend of ours. So we were playing a lot of four-player games, which actually puts me in kind of an odd situation because normally I rank all my games relatively relative to each other about how they are as a two-player experience. But some of these I've only now played as a four-player. So we'll get to that as we come along. But for starters, I'm going to talk about a handful of expansions we played in countdown form. And then once I've done the expansions, I'll talk about the new game. So uh, let's go to expansion countdown, starting at number five, if I recall correctly. Runestone, Enchanted Forest, and Nocturnal Creatures. And here's the deal. These are two great little box expansions that add some very much appreciated additional content for Runestone. And Runestone is already... Or is it Runestone or Runestones? Oh my gosh, it's Runestones! Sorry, everybody. Um, Runestones is a fantastic uh, deck-building game from Rudiger Dorn, uh, who is you know like one of the OG modern Euro designers. He has done so many really important games over the years. Istanbul, Goa. And I don't think Runestones gets as much attention as other ones, but oh my gosh, it's fantastic. It, it's just full from beginning to end with really nail-biting, agonizing decisions. And both expansions add some really cool stuff. If I could only own one of them, I'd probably go with Enchanted Forest because it adds the super important new runestones. In the original game, every time you play, you just play with the same runestones that players are trying to get to unlock special powers and stuff like that. Now there's a whole bunch of new ones so you can mix and match and get a different layout every time. That's gigantic, and I was a big fan of that. Absolutely must have. Uh, it also has this uh, side objective where we're trying to make our way through a little winding path, collecting mushrooms and getting bonus points. That was nice. But I was really kind of disappointed by how it was inter, inter, um, um, implemented because there was no two-player scaling at all. And th this kind of thing, it's so easy to get that right, and they got it wrong. So Enchanted Force is really important, and it's great at a higher player count, but it kind of misses the boat just by a tiny bit for two-player on the actual Enchanted Force sideboard. Nocturnal Creatures is the other one. This adds wisps, and it adds a new type of creature. It actually brings in a little bit of uh, PvP, take that kind of stuff. Some of these new creatures, they were pretty mild, though. I don't think they really bothered me and Jen very much at all, and we're really super Care Bears. The wisps were very cool. Um, the ability to get these really super powerful one-off bonuses that you can use at the exact right time was very very satisfying and um yeah uh, runestones is already great these are both great expansions i'm just going to lump them together as one and then knock them down they come in at the bottom of the list because of the total and complete lack of two-player scaling in the enchanted force but still kind of a must-have um then we move on to number four. It's a Wonderful World, Ascension, and Corruption. And now this is a very simple expansion for one of the best engine-building card-drafting games of all time. It's a Wonderful World was a huge hit. Everybody loves it. And Ascension and Corruption adds, well, really two new concepts. The Ascension is a bunch of new... Um, I was going to say buildings you can build, but they're not. They're all kind of mythological. Like, you can discover Valhalla now. In a game that was formerly very grounded in, like, a near-future, um, you know, society, now you can get, like, some really far-out mystical elements going on. And that was kind of nice to mix things up. I think more importantly is the corruption, which adds this new concept of cards that when you add them to your overall goods-generating engine, they actually weaken your engine. But the cards are so good or so cheap, you're, in, in, you're, you're inclined to do it in Anyway, even if it might gum up your works. And I found that really fascinating. The reason Ascension and Corruption comes in at number four and doesn't rate higher, it has nothing to do with it. It's just, it's kind of a, a little bit more uh, expansion. You know, sometimes expansions like really blow the doors off and reinvent a game and come up with really new interesting takes on it. And sometimes they say, oh, here's just a few more cards, kind of like what you've already got. This is like that, and it does it wonderfully. It just didn't quite get me as excited as some of the stuff that's coming. 
And so, uh, coming in at number four is Wonderful World, Ascension, and Corruption. Really, if you like It's a Wonderful World, you got to get it. Because more is always good. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to number three. Excavation Earth. It belongs in a museum. And now, this was a paid Kickstarter preview for an expansion uh, for a really interesting sci-fi... Uh, market manipulation game where it's the far future, humanity has died out, and now aliens come to Earth to find uh, weird, quirky artifacts of our civilization and sell them on the open market or the black market. What this expansion adds is, now we can take those artifacts and donate them to a museum. Which I have to say, thematically, I really like. Um, you know, just the idea that, um, you know, even though we're long forgotten, rather than all of our artifacts of our society just ending up on some millionaire alien shelf, they actually end up in a museum where people can come and learn about us. I mean, it's neither here nor there. I mean, this is pretty much just a market manipulation game, but it was kind of a nice feeling. But the gameplay, it adds an entirely new avenue, a new path to victory, because you can get tons of points by, instead of selling on the open market or the black market, donating them at the right time to make the curators of the museum happy, and they're constantly in rotation. Every time somebody interacts with the museum, it changes everything, like everything else in this game. Uh, you know, Excavation Earth is all about synergy between players and looking for opportunities that other players create. And the museum module does that wonderfully. But that's not all. In addition to the museum module, there's two completely new playable alien races that add new cool special powers. That was all very nice. And then there's also mysterious artifacts. And these really change things up because these can't be sold. Instead, what you need to do with artifacts is when you send envoys to the space station, they can take the artifacts you find, the mysterious artifacts, and take them up there as like a little bonus action, and then they get researched. And when you do that, what happens is you unlock cool special reverse engineering cards. And these cards are radically game-changing, super powerful stuff. Um, and the interesting thing is, every time another player researches one of these mysterious artifacts, um, the remaining ones that could still be found in the world become more valuable to sell on the black market. Because the more the aliens know about our society, the more they're willing to pay. So in the early game, you try to research them. In the late game, when you don't need those powers anymore, you try to sell them because they're worth a lot. And they can really change the game up. And then there was other stuff too. Big improvement to the solo mode. Huge improvement. Because now the solo player can run out of cubes like a human player. Big, uh, uh, big improvement. And um, you know, other stuff like research cubes you can use. Brokers you can use to turn your car into wild cards, which is a big deal as well. Everything about this is, expansion is fantastic. This is why I was. This is not just. Oh, here's a little bit more content. There are big, game-changing ideas, but they don't lose the spirit of the original game. And I think that's implemented perfectly by Dave Turchi and the crew at Mighty Boards. Uh, my number three of the month, Excavation Earth. It belongs in a museum. Then we go on to number two. Hey, it wouldn't be a Rattle Roundup if I didn't play some Marvel Champions. And this month, I got Venom in the mail. Uh, this is not the original classic Venom everybody thinks of. This is the modern Venom in Marvel Comics. Flash Thompson, uh, who was Peter Parker's nemesis in high school, eventually went to war, um, I, you know, lost his legs, came back, was bitter, bounded with the symbiote, and then became an international or you know, an intergalactic space cop. It's a really weird, funky thing. If you read the comics, Venom is not what you expect it to be. If you've seen the movies or, you know, read classic Venom. But this is a very, very cool character who probably more than anybody else is really focused on weaponry. Because that's a big part of uh, this, you know, American soldier who has, you know, a space symbiote as a best buddy. Uh, you can break the rules for how many um, restricted items you can carry. And uh, it's just a really good, fun, solid, uh, you know, addition. I wouldn't say it's quite as mind-bending. I mean, it, 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 you know, some of the heroes are like really just blown my eyes out with, oh my gosh, how did you capture the spirit of that character just in these cards? This one just feels a little bit more, um, you know, like it's just a, another nice, great addition to the game. I had a very uh, fun time playing with Venom, and as always, it keeps, uh, keeps me coming back to Marvel Champions. So that was my number two of the month, Venom. But the number one expansion was... Such a big deal. Such a wonderful, wonderful experience my wife and I had playing Rococo, the Deluxe Edition. And now, I covered Rococo many, many years ago. Um, but, you know, the original first edition. Was it from Pegasus, I think? Is that right? Um, well, I don't remember who the publishers were, but, you know, the designers, Matthias Kramer and the uh, Maltzes, uh, Ste uh, Stefan and Louis Maltz, 
a great, great game, um, which I raved about at the time. And between then and now, some uh, expansion content came out for the original version of Rococo, including the jewelry expansion, which I always wanted to try, but it got an incredibly small print run and it was incredibly hard to find. Fast forward to now, we have the new Deluxe Edition, and so I finally got to experience the uh, jewelry expansion, which is... It's exactly what I like to see in expansions. It's a big game changer. It doesn't um, you know, alter the fundamental DNA of the game. It just gives you this whole new path you can focus on. In addition to making garments for all the rich people who are going to a party at Louis XV's uh, um, you know, palace, now you can get them jewelry as well. That's nice, but what's more important is if you, you have a checklist of actions you can have your apprentices do. And once you do all these, in the process of doing all your normal stuff, you unlock new super powerful journeymen. And then once you've done that, you can train journeymen journeyman to become new super powerful upgraded masters with all kinds of powers that you have not seen before and this new sideboard really opens up the game and gives you so much more to focus on and so many more opportunities to try to get super hyper efficient moves my wife absolutely loved this this significantly raised the game in her opinion and i thought it was fun too i i i one, I want to play it a little bit more because maybe it makes the game a little bit more prescribed because you really want to get those bonuses. But um, still, I you know the two times we played it, plus the run-through I filmed of it, we had such a great time. I was blown away and just reminded just how wonderful the core design of Rococo always was. So that's my number one expansion, the Deluxe Edition, specifically the Jewelry Expansion, plus the other promos that have all been boxed together in a new lavish reprint that just looks lovely. Okay. So that was that, folks. Now, let's start talking about games. And let's begin with For Sale. And I can't rank this one, folks, because normally all of my games are played two-player, and so I rank them relative to that, but For Sale is not a two-player game. Um, it is a, acquires at least a minimum of three. And so here's the deal. If I were to rank this game just solely on its merits, this is probably my game of the month easily. And I can see why it is so well loved. It's a it's a modern classic from designer Stephen Dora. It's basically a real estate auction game that's in two halves. The first half of the game, we are um, using uh, unique money chits to bid on houses. And it's a go around, everybody keeps raising until somebody gets what they want. The interesting thing about that half of the game is, in most auction games, yeah, you just keep bidding up, bidding up, never expecting to buy. You're just trying to make it more expensive for other players. And there's a little risk that you might end up getting stuck with it. In this game, if you end up passing, you end up losing half of the money you threw into those averaging bids. So that makes it much more tension-filled trying to drive the price up. But that's only the first half of the game. Then the second half of the game is we take all the houses we won in the first half and we use them as bidding um, in a blind auction where every round for a number of players there's going to be um, these checks, which are the actual points. Checks signed for, and we're trying to sell these houses for those checks. And the brilliant thing about this, honestly, I'm not really a big fan often of blind bidding but it works so well here because um, everybody's bidding, not just for one. There's a bunch out. And uh, you know, if you bid lowest, you just get last dibs. If you bid highest, you get first dibs. And it's interesting that you'll be in situations where, oh, I've got some of my low-value houses. I don't mind throwing them out there. Or I'm sorry, uh, uh, because all the checks we're bidding on the second half, they're all terrible this round. So now is a good time to burn the crappy houses I won. And so it creates a wonderful two auctions that you play back to back in like less than 20 minutes and it's absolutely brilliant. And like I said, this would be my game of the month. Except, since I can't really rate it as a two-player game, like I'm going to rate every other game I'm talking about today, I'm leaving it off the rating scale. But, if I had the opportunity to, I would play for sale in a heartbeat. One of the best auction games I have ever played in my life. It is brilliant. It deserves its ongoing modern classic status. That's for sale. Okay, now let's move on to my number 10 of the month, Majesty for the Realm, which is a uh, card tableau building game where we have a whole bunch of different buildings in front of us and we're trying to grab medieval characters who belong in those buildings, the bartender in the bar, the blacksmith in the smithy, and stuff like that. And the more of a given type of card we get and lay in front of our building, the more we get to activate that type of building and the more powerful it becomes. It's a good, sharp game from the designer, Mark andre of Splendor. And like Splendor, it is an incredibly simple, clean, fast-playing, elegant game with some interesting decisions throughout. 
It comes in fairly low for us uh, because one, as a two-player game, um, some of this, uh, some stuff doesn't work as well. There are certain benefits you get for hey, if somebody does this, per uh, you know, drafts this particular character and activates this power, then everybody else gets a bonus. And in a two-player game, there's not going to be very many opportunities for that. Whereas the higher player count, the better it's going to be. Plus, there's an unfortunate amount of take that of players just kind. Of, uh, if you get soldiers, you can really mess with opponents. It's like, why is this here? This doesn't need to be here. There are so many great examples examples these days of positive interaction between players. Why are we punching each other and are trying to defend ourselves from being punched throughout the whole game? So that was kind of a bummer. But it was still a sharp game. And if I were looking for a very, very light card tableau building game that has a healthy dollop of punchy punch and is great for higher player counts, I'd give Majesty, Ma Majesty for the Realm a go. It's just not our cup of tea. And that's why it comes in at number 10 of the month. Majesty for the Realm. Okay, then we go on to number nine, Nidavellir. Now, this is another auction game. It is set in a fantasy kingdom where a bunch of dwarves are hanging around at three taverns. And we have been charged to go to those taverns and use all the money we've got on hand to recruit them to join an army to save the kingdom. That's the theme. Really, this is just a game where every round we're going to be bidding on um, three different auctions. But we all have to place our bid simultaneously in secret at the beginning of a round. So if I see there's a dwarf in the first bar who I really want, um, and then the other two bars I don't really care that much about, then I mean, I've mean i only got so many coins I can use, and I'll probably put the really high bid on that one, um, and then you know the low bids on the other ones. But what if I don't get that high one? Um, you know, Because I'm... I'm further down in, um, in initiative. Because if there's a tie on bids, there's an initiative system that means I may or may not win. I don't want to waste my most valuable coin and then not get that person I want. So maybe I should go on ahead and bid lower. The fact that it is three simultaneous secret reveal auctions is really interesting and creates a lot of depth, especially because one of the bids you can make is effectively zero. I'm not going to bid anything for this, but it means I can upgrade my other coins, but I'll just have to take last dibs on whatever is available. Now, here's the deal. This game is brilliant. There's so many cool special powers when, you know, and different ways to score points and so much tension throughout if you play at a higher player count, which we got to do. Jen and I played it as a two-player game afterwards, and it all disappears. All that cool, fun excitement and tension and drama, because um, at a lower player count, there are enough dwarves that you never really feel very tense about what you're bidding on. You're always going to get something good. You're never going to get left out in the cold. And I think they just didn't do a very good job. There would have been a simple, simple rule change, I think, for two-player that would have brought that tension back. And it's simply this. Um, you know, when your, your three dwarves are at each bar. When we're trying to figure out uh, in the first bar, okay, do I want to bid high or low because I really like that dwarf? If I win the high bid of that bar, I take the dwarf I want, and then I eliminate one of the other two. And then that means you, the low bidder, are stuck with whatever I gave you. And then all of a sudden, all of that tension and drama would come back. And it would be just there. I suspect. I didn't actually try this. This is uh, you know, a homebrew variant. You can try yourself if you have a copy of Ned of Valir. I believe this would so elevate the two-player experience and bring all of that excitement and tension and fear back. Because as a two-player game, it's, just like, it's so laid back. Oh, yeah, I don't care what I bid. I'm always going to get something good because there's just an overflow of riches. And that doesn't happen at the higher player counts. So um, that's why Ned of Valir as a two-player game with the rules as written, comes in at my number nine of the month. But again, at a higher player count, oh my gosh, an amazing auction game. I can see why people love it so much. Need of Okay, let's move on to number eight, Clever Cubed. Now, this is the third game in the Gone Shown Clever series of Roll and Rights. And I would have to say, of the three, I, this is probably the heaviest one. Um, you know, some of the... Uh, Stuff you have to go through to figure out, um, you know, how to, you know, draft the dice, you know, hold some dice for yourself. You know, the rest go to, you know, a, a common pool that everybody can share from. Um, but, you know, the different colored dice activate different scoring tracks. And they, some of these ones are really far out. They really push the envelope and make you have to really commit and take big, big risks and gambles. Also, not for nothing, I would say this is the hardest one to teach because some of the ideas here really break the rules of traditional um, 
Rollin writes, and I mean that in the best possible way. This is a brilliant game. My wife absolutely loved it. I thought it was really great too. Now, like uh, what I've been talking about so far, Gone Shown Clever is definitely a better game at higher player counts because every die you don't take that goes to more players, if there's more players, that just creates more drama and excitement. But uh, I would still say Gone Shown Clever is a great two-player game as well. So, the third in the series which I would say is arguably the heaviest, most gamey. I mean, this I would never recommend somebody start the Gone series with Clever Cubed. Start with the first, move on to the second, and then you've elevated. This is for Gone's aficionado super experts. And it's great. It comes in low for me because it's abstract. And that drives me nuts. Uh, there could be a theme here. In fact, as I understand it, um, the designer, um, Wolfgang Varsh, originally had a uh, farming theme that was layered on top, and the the, the, the uh, publishers just stripped it out. And that's always kind of bugged me. The gameplay is, as always, fantastic. A little bit heavier, a little bit crunchier, a little bit wonkier and more quirky, but still great. And if you don't mind pure abstracts, then you're going to have a great time with Clever Cubed. Or Gone Shown Clever 3. Okay, now we move on to number 7, Tussie Mussie. This is a micro game. If I recall correctly, I think... I think it comes with 18 cards, maybe it's 16. But it's there's a lot of game packed into a tiny little package from publisher Buttonshy and designer Elizabeth Hargraves, Miss Wingspan herself. Yes, that Wingspan. And also um, the uh, Monarch Butterfly game that his name completely escapes me at the moment. Oh, that's driving me nuts. But anyway, Elizabeth Hargraves is definitely you know one of the preeminent premier designers because Wingspan was so game-changing for the industry in such a big way. It's a brilliant design, and here's the deal. Tussie Mussie is brilliant, too. And having played Wingspan and now this, that solidifies my feeling that, um, you know, uh, Elizabeth Hargraves is not a one-hit wonder. She is here to stay. Here's the way the game works. It's super simple. On my turn, I draw two cards, and I look to my neighbor... And I, and I put play one card face up, the other one face down. They're going to take one of those two cards. I'm going to keep one. And the mind games can begin. It is so deep, so tense. Because um, you know if they take a face down one, I and they know what that is. Nobody else around the table knows what it is. If they take a face up one, I keep the face one down for myself. And nobody knows what it is but me. And these cards interact in so many different ways. If um, you take a card that's face up that says, well, you'll get a lot of bonus points if you get a lot of red cards, your neighbor knows don't keep the red cards away. But how can they do it? They just draw two cards and they have to give you one. So, do they hide it? Um, do you take the one that's hidden because it's something that's being kept from you? Or is it a trap? Because not all cards are created equal. Some of them might be completely useless to you. And so, when you are on the receiving end from the player to your right, oh, it's so tough. Why are you hiding? That seems like a really obvious one. You probably think I'm going to take that, which means I should take the hidden one. But did you put that because you knew that's the way I think, and you don't want me to take the obvious one, and the, and the hidden one is a trap? And then, after you've made that decision, you get whatever you get, you turn around and you do the same thing to your neighbor. It's brilliant. Oh my gosh, this would also be in my top three games of the month. When viewed as a higher player count game. As a two-player game, it still works. It's a lot of fun. A fast little five-minute game you can play at a bar. But... Only having one opponent robs 50% of the experience because it's so fun. What am I going to give to you and what am I going to take from you? When both of those questions are related to the same person and there's not two different sets of cards that I'm keeping track of, it's still great. It just loses some of what makes this game truly resplendent. So um, this is why um, I, I have to put in number seven, but this would be one of my top rated games, period, for the month. <sighs> Gosh, I mean, I don't remember what gear this came out. This could be a top 10 for the year if I rated games based on their qualities at higher player counts. As a two-player game, it's nice. It's very nice. As a three or more player game, it's resplendent. Either way, it's my number seven of the month, Tussie Mussie. Uh, great job, Elizabeth. Fantastic. Can't wait to see what we come up with next. Okay, let's move on to number six, Indus. 2500 BCE. Another roll and write. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people, if they go and watch my run-through, you could be forgiven for thinking, wait a minute, isn't this a cartographer's um, spin-off or something like that? Because, uh, you know, at first glance, there are certain things about it that really feel the same. Uh, every turn, you're going to end up getting a uh, card that has a Tetris polyomino shape on it and some type of terrain. 
forests, rivers, buildings, and stuff like that. And you're going to have to, somewhere on your grid, draw that polyomino shape with those particular resources. And that's very cartographers-y. Um, now, this game is actually set, you know, in, what was it, Stone Age? No, I think it was Bronze Age, um, you know, the Indus Valley. And uh, it really puts a lot of work and attention on getting the theme right and really capturing the way the world works back then. And one of the big things it adds is calamities because in the big deck of cards that we're you know getting all of these directive cards from, there will be two calamities, one early, one late. The last one triggers the end of the game and you have to build to try to score the most points, because every time you play, there's going to be a different combination of four different bonus ways to score points. And you also are trying to get majorities in pretty much everything, because that's a lot of points too. But you also have to build anticipating those um, calamities. You can put walls up to protect yourself from some. You can um, effectively quarantine certain areas to protect you from other types of calamities. And you got to keep all this in your brain while you're playing. And it, it is surprisingly crunchy. And actually, I talked to the developers. They were developing this long before they'd ever heard of cartographers. So... Um, you know, it's it's kind of unfortunate that there's an overlap that some people say, oh, I already have cartographers, so why would I want this? Personally, I would take this one over cartographers because the calamities, I do think the objectives um, really create a lot more interesting tension. And it's a game where you're not attacking each other, unlike cartographers, which has a healthy dollop of R. Right, how can I mess up the stuff you've made? This is a wonderful Care Bear game. Um, my wife really loved it a lot, too. And uh, yeah, if you want to know more, go check out my run-through for my number six of the month, Indus 2500 BCE. Then we go on to number five, Rajas of the Ganges, the Dice Charmers. Lovely roll and write from um, you know Inca and Marcus Brand, the design duo behind so many great, wonderful, big box Euros. I mean, too many to mention. Um, including Rajas the Ganges, which was an absolutely brilliant resource gathering manipulation game, which the central crux was all about, hey, I'm trying to make money, but I'm trying to make prestige. These are two different score tracks, and they go, one goes clockwise around the board, the other goes counterclockwise, and when they meet, that's what triggers the end of the game. That and so much else is captured from the big box and broad into a tiny little dice drafting game that just is the bee's knees. Jen and I instantly fell in love with it. Um, it's got all the great Raja's feel, but in a fraction of the time, and I would say a fair bit more interaction because of the way the draft works. Because now we're drafting for dice. And, um, you know, these are really cool special dice with all kinds of special powers on them and whatnot. And really, I think more than anything else, what really makes me love this game is, more so than the original Raja's, oh my gosh, this is so combo-tastic. Um, you know, if you're familiar with the Gone Shown Clever series of Roll and Rights, which is all about, oh, I did this one thing, which unlocked this, which allowed me to do this, and because I'd already saved up and done all that, that undoes this other thing, and you can have these monster turns where you do five or six or seven big actions all chained together. That happens all over the place in Rajas of the Ganges Dice Charmers, and I love it. I love it in Gone Shown Clever, but Gone Shown Clever is a very abstract game. Rajas the Ganges, Dice Charmer, shows how you don't have to be abstract. You can actually have a nice thematic um, roll and write and still get all that really cool, wonderful, puzzly roll and write goodness with um, you know, uh, dealing with all the different um, characters from the palace or going down the river or you know, um, you know, building buildings in the surrounding countryside. It feels like you're doing something in this game instead of just filling in colored boxes. And that's what so elevates Rajas of the Ganges, the Dice Charmer is my number five of the month. It is excellent. Okay, then we go on to number four, Oros, which is a paid Kickstarter for you for a game that I think is on right now. And wow, this game is really unique, quite unlike anything else out there. We are gods in the primordial earth. Um, we are worshipped by followers, and we can use our powers to basically sculpt the world to our whim. We can grab entire continents and shift them around and slam them into other continents, and that will create new mega continents. And it will also create volcanoes, which over time can erupt and spill and create new land over the empty ocean. And we're doing all of this to try to sculpt this world to make a better place for our followers, um, who are also our workers in a quasi-worker placement game. That um, Actually, somebody pointed out in my run-through in the comments that it kind of has sort of a feel of scythe in the worker placement game, and it's really well implemented. But what really is special about this game is, I mean, 
I, when I talked about it in my main run-through, I, I likened it to Populous, the old uh, Peter Molyneux video game. You really do feel like a god, just sculpting this world in front of you, slamming all these things together, uh, making the volcanoes erupt, and then directing where the lava will flow to create new land for your people to live in and to prosper in. And it's awesome. And then on top of that, it's got a really fantastically implemented upgradable tech tree as well. Um, I mean, you've got to check this game out, folks. It's kind of blowing up uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a you know, not, not like a, you know, multi-million, uh, you know, campaign on Kickstarter, but it's doing very, very well, and it really deserves to. It's, you know, it's a fresh design from, you know, a fresh designer. It's what Kickstarter was made for, to support dreams like this, and bring us something like we've never seen before. It's my number four of the month, Oros. Okay, now we move on to number three, Venice. From design duo of uh, Dave Turchi and Andre Novak, and these two guys working together have made something very special. And what do I mean by that? This is, for my money, probably the best pickup and delivery game I've ever played. Or certainly the best, the one I have enjoyed the most. Because um, we are influential patrons in Venice, you know, trying to make deals and, um, you know, uh, upstanding, uh, you know, investments into properties, but also back channel nefarious stuff, you know, earning special powers that we can use at certain points, deploying our operatives to different buildings so we can activate them to get more buildings and leveling them up over the course of the game so they get stronger and stronger so that when we visit them on our gondolas, they will give us big paydays. But at its heart, while all that's going on, your main thing is you have two gondolas on the board. At any given time, you've got these objectives where you have to pick up certain cubes in one place and deliver them somewhere else. And the thing that makes it really unique is that you have two gondolas, and you must, unless you're willing to pay a huge price, you must alternate back and forth between the two. So, the level of logistical planning in this game is off the charts brilliant. And I was really blown away by it. I mean, like I said, both my wife and I vehemently dislike pick up and deliver as a mechanism. But here, we found ourselves pulled in because of all the extra levels of complexity of trying to manage two different delivery trucks or gondolas, getting them to coincide, knowing when to pay the extra to have the, the one go multiple times in a row. Um, also, this game just has an amazing sense of escalation. Uh, you start out very small, but by the end, you can pull off really major super moves. You could easily go from one side of Venice to the other without even blinking an eye, whereas, you know, it was unthinkable at the beginning of the game. So, so, incredible satisfaction, the uh, the arc that you travel through as you level up in this game. Both you and your followers as they get stronger and stronger in all the buildings and become more powerful pit stops for you. There's also a lot of really interesting, um, not really aggressive or nasty take that interaction for players, but rather um, your position and my position is really influential. If I'm in a dock and you come to the same dock I'm at, I get bonus points for showing up. So you don't want to go there until I leave. But I, my next move is going to be the other gondola. So are you going to wait? Um, there's a lot to juggle. You're really invested in what the other players are doing. And I think it's a brilliant design. My only complaints, and they're pretty significant, the board is too small, and it makes it much more fiddly than it should be to play this game. If the board were 30% bigger, this game would be 80% more playable. Now, it's a problem. I don't care. The gameplay is still good enough to um, to warrant play in spite of that. The other thing, there are a bunch of little special case rules, and it's kind of hard to keep track of it. Now, a lot of the depth and complexity of the game comes from those rules, so I can't complain too much. Um, you know, I mean, some rough edges could have been sanded off. You could have simplified and streamlined a little bit. But I don't know if the game would be as good at that point, quite frankly. And, I mean, the gameplay is brilliant. Watch for my run-through. Coming soon, just waiting for Paulo to goof-check it. Really blown away by this. I think it's really flying under the radar, but it's uh, super smart. I mean, again, it takes a, a really fantastic design to get me and Jen to be invested in Pick Up and Deliver. And for my money, this is probably the best Pick Up and Deliver game I've ever played. My number three of the month, Venice. Then we got number two, Remember Our Trip. Oh my gosh, this is so lovely, so wonderful, so charming from a Japanese publisher, Sashi and Sashi, I believe, who are known for really kind of quirky, offbeat themes. The theme of this game is we are all working to try to remember a trip we recently got back from. 
And whoever can best remember is going to win the game. And the thing is, we all have our own board where we, we're draft for these memory chips that represent the hotels we stayed at, the parks we went through, the tourist sites we saw, the shops we shopped at, stuff like that. And every round, I'm going to end up getting uh, two or three of these chips. And there, every round, there is a blueprint that says how I must play them on my board. And I'm trying to lay them out to create certain patterns so that I can confirm, yes, this was the hotel we stayed at. That was the park I went for a walk in on the second day. This was the place where I bought you that umbrella, this shop over here. Um, because once you have actually built the little poly uh, polyomino shape uh, that you need to, to be able to confirm, yes, this was a shop, this was a restaurant, whatever, you can then flip them and score points, but you also transcribe the memory of that building onto a communal board which is where you can score a lot of bonus points. And the thing is, as soon as I say, you know what, it was up in the northeast corner, that's where that restaurant was. And I put that up there, and now that might drive you nuts because you were building on your board, I was remembering that there was a park over there. And all of a sudden, you can still say, nope, this is the park on my own board, but I can't transcribe it to the communal board. So it's kind of this really interesting area control-esque game. It's hard to describe. Watch my run-through. It's brilliant. It's such a really far out um, uh, approach to uh, gaming. I, I, I was blown away by it. Just talking about it right now makes me want to play it again. It's my number two of the month. Remember our trip. But the number one, folks, that has to go to now or never, which was also a paid preview. This is the culmination of the Azrium or the Azerium series a trilogy from designer artist Ryan Lockett. First, he gave us um, Above and Below which was a great little, um, you know, kind of city building, worker placement -y type game. Then he gave us Near and Far, which was a great little narrative adventure traveling the world while managing your resources game. That was a direct sequel, and it carried the story on. Um, and now we have the third game, Now or Never, which kind of combines the spirit of those two previous games. It's got the really interesting um, worker management, because a lot of what you can do is by having a crew of people with all kinds of special powers, Hours, but you can only activate them once per round. And um, so trying to figure out the correct order to activate these followers of yours to get the most out of them is really important. But the tricky thing is your opponents can pay you to use your followers. And like, hey, I'm really glad you gave me the three coins, but I was planning on using him to build myself. Now i got to wait till next turn, unless I turn around and use one of your followers instead. So there's a really wonderful interplay between players that isn't aggressive or nasty. Uh, it's just really interesting and interactive in a positive way. Way. Um, and one of the main things you're using those followers for is to rebuild a massive city. And this rebuilding game, it can almost be a game by itself. It has kind of a Goa feel with the snake-like draft where once you take a tile from a place, you have to take future tiles from that spot. And once you build that tile in a place, you have to build off that spot. The city building is wonderful in this game. Really dense and puzzly. But then on top of all that, it's got a big sweeping landscape that you can travel from one side to the other and complete quests and fight monsters and level up and get cool powers. And you can focus on any or all of these things. Uh, um, and it's all driven by a big uh, multi-chapter narrative story where our unique characters go and grow as people. And um, it's just everything about this game just works perfectly. Absolutely blown away by it. I'll, I'll deduct a minor point because combat is still a dice thing. Um, although... It's much better than most dice combat, quite frankly. I don't even know if I want to deduct that. Uh, basically, you've got four powers. When you attack a monster, you roll a d4 to activate power number one, two, three, or four. There are ways you can mitigate and re-roll, but you know, if you level up your powers, you should always be able to get some good rolls. It's it's just the best. It's Ryan Locke. It's, it's what he's been building towards. And a lot of us thought what we use been building towards all these years is Sleeping Gods. You know, uh, you know, A lot of us thought, hey, that's his masterpiece. But I'm here to tell you, folks, if, if, you had to, if I had to pick, you want to play some Sleeping Gods or some Now or Never, oh my gosh. Now it's now. I'm going to have the song stuck in my head for the rest of the day. I was about to start singing it. I will not do it to you, but it's my game of the month. It is absolutely fantastic. Ryan, it's the culmination of everything he's done so far. I love it to pieces. My number one of the month, Now or Never. Okay, folks, that's it. Another roundup done and dusted. And uh, hope you can agree, those were some very, very cool games. And wait, let's see what we uh, have in August. The most important thing we, of course, will have in August is going to be more R&R &R with me and Ruel. Check us out. 
every Wednesday live. Although if you can't make it, don't worry. You can watch it after the fact. You can just subscribe to the channel and you'll always be able to catch them. Uh, again, on Twitch, on Facebook, or on YouTube. Um, come and join. I mean, we really want to try to get a lot of audience participation, Q&As, having the audience make suggestions for us. I mean, this is really... If you're a longtime fan of the show, you might have watched a show I was doing uh, last year with Tom Vassell called Corner to Corner. Ever since that ended, um, folks have been saying, we want more Corner to Corner. And so, um, you know, Tom's too busy to do it, and you know, our schedules don't always match. But Ruel and I were able to find a way to, um, I, well, I don't know. Well, mostly, first and foremost, we're just having a great time. And I hope you come along and have a great time, too. And if you do it quick, you could win a copy of Fort. But anyway, folks, that was it. And as always, thanks for watching, and thanks to Fun Again Games for sponsoring the show. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye